Hey everybody, welcome to week eight of PS231. Can you believe that? Week eight. More importantly, by the end of today's lecture, you will be halfway done, at least with the stupid lectures. Um, and and given that, I, I thought I was originally going to try to put this halfway through the video, um, but that seemed, uh, I'm not that good of an editor and it probably was only going to obfuscate things. I didn't, I haven't wanted to talk about it too much or anything, but I, it is not lost on me that, that this is a somewhat strange um, way to get this material to you. Maybe this is a weird best response to the circumstances we find ourselves under. And it's gotten me thinking a lot about teaching and teachers and, and some of the great teachers that I've had and, and maybe what they would have thought about how it is to teach under these circumstances, you know? And it actually got me thinking about um, the math teacher that I had when I was a little kid. Her name was Sister Rosalinda. And she was the best math teacher ever. She was maybe the best teacher I ever saw. Um, and it wasn't that she was super nice or anything. Uh, she was nice. She was very kind. She had a very warm spirit. But then once the teaching began, like if you saw her outside of class, you know, it's ice cream social or whatever. She was the nicest, coolest, sweetest person. Fun to talk to. And then math class started and she was just a beast. You know, like <laughs> it was, it was really cool to watch her. I could remember her sort of locking in. You know, and she would just kind of go from being this sweet little Sister Rosalinda lady to being the math teacher that you didn't know that you needed. And what I loved about Sister Rosalinda, who I'm assuming has since left us, is she, um, she, she, she left you a lot of space. She was like Miles Davis teaching, right? So, so some jazz musicians respond to improvisation by trying to fill the space as much as they can, right? John Coltrane. Others respond by trying to leave a lot of space. Miles Davis leaves a lot of space. The, there's a lot of quiet when he plays an improvised solo. He's, he doesn't feel like he has to, to, to be talking the whole time. And you're like, hey, Rob, why don't you take a page out of the Miles Davis playbook? Point well taken. And so when she taught, she would write something on the board and she would just kind of wait. She would let you have your osmosis moment. She'd wait for you to, to have that flicker of insight. And she'd be watching you. She she didn't want, if you were picking your nose during that time, that was a really subpar time to be picking your nose, okay? And so she would, you know, she just sort of write something on the board and go, what you got? You know, she wouldn't say it like that, but that's essentially what she, that's essentially what she'd be saying. I just wish that somebody would have videotaped her. I really wish that somebody would have caught that because... It's way better than that, that sort of maybe the math pedagogy that we need right now is whatever was on Sister Rosalinda's mind. And I'm sure that she wouldn't have been on board with all of these videos and all this fun and all the, all the tomfoolery, but I think that she would have been pleased. And it got me thinking that, that you're probably doing a lot of things that would have a lot of people pleased too. You, you're working really hard. I know that you're working really hard. Many of you are taking many, many classes. Um, I've heard upwards of seven. I've heard of some of you are taking as many as seven classes. That might that's a that's a conservative upper bound. Some of you are working jobs while you're doing this, be it uh, sort of a, a gig sort of job or a full time job or something where you're telecommuting. Some of you uh, are doing this either from home, and so you might not have all all the separation that you're accustomed to when you're when you're taking college classes, or you might be taking you might be completely isolated right now. Some of you are sick or. Um, have have recovered from this illness that has everybody so down at the moment. Um, you're, you're, you're pushing real hard. You're pushing really, really hard. And there would be people that would be very proud to know how hard you're working. You know, they'd be happy to know that this is your montage moment. It's not going to be the end of the movie or anything, but this is the important thing that's going to take you from where you are to where you're getting to. And there'd be people that would be very proud to know about all the obstacles that you're overcoming and all the sweat that you're putting into things. And I'm going to steal a page from a really important playbook this time, not the Miles Davis playbook, but another one. And I'm going to ask you to take 10 seconds to think about the people that would be proud of how hard you're working right now. I'll watch the time.
you don't have to call them. I mean, in some cases you might not be able to, um, but I'm sure they'd be very happy to know that you were thinking about them just now. And if you can, maybe let them know. We haven't talked at all about time in this class. Not a single moment of our time together has been spent talking about time. What the heck? How can we think about strategy? So if I'm playing chess, there's a chess board right there. If I'm playing chess, it's not like time doesn't matter, right? And I don't mean clock time. I mean, when I make a move, I do so having observed what my opponent did. I get to move after my opponent moves. After. After. Or they move before me and I move after them. Have we talked about before and after? We have not said a single thing about before and after in this class. Not a single thing. And yet, the, 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 the strategiest, most strategic thing I can think of right now, this chess set over my board. You never get to make simultaneous moves. Every game we've looked at up to this point has been simultaneous moves, and that chess set back behind me indicates that I've been wasting my time with you. Except I don't have a concept of time, so I don't even know what I've wasted. We need to talk about time. We need to talk about observation. We need to talk about response that isn't just response to hypotheticals, but response to actual contingencies. We need to think about the role of the future in today's best choices. We need to think about how our previous choices condition what is best for us now. We need to think about how the things that we've learned from the past influence what we're going to do in the future. We haven't talked. Bakker Stravinsky, we literally said, nobody has been able to talk to anybody within the recent time frame, and so we have no choice, but it's 6.59 and we need to drive to a show. And you've been very kind and patient and not saying, hey, Rob, what the heck with that? What's the point of a fable that doesn't include an opportunity to observe and respond and react? We haven't talked about that. And it seems like a lot of important interactions in politics involve time. Whether or not you believe my promises made today depends on how likely you think I am to live up to those promises tomorrow. What you think about what kind of person I may be depends in part on what I've done in the past. If we don't have a sense about how the shadow of the future influences strategy, or if we don't have a sense about how information garnered from the past influences strategy, then we're not going to be able to talk about politics in any meaningful sense. So let's begin to remedy this wrong. So today I want to introduce games in the extensive form. These are games that explicitly introduce the idea that what one person does may be conditioned on what they see happen in the past. Now, time here is no more real than it was before, right? I'm not suddenly going to say, and imagine what happens at 16 seconds after. Like, it's not going to be like that. But at the very least, nothing is going to be super duper simultaneous. Now, back with simultaneous moves, we didn't think that actual... Like, the prisoners don't have to say cooperate or defect at the same exact time. What makes that simultaneous move is not actual literal simultaneity. What makes that simultaneous move is the fact that the two two suspects who are being held in two separate interrogation rooms don't get to observe what the other one does. So time here is, is a stand-in. I'm talking about time in a stylized way, not actual time. Not that any of us knows what the heck actual time is, by the way. Time introduces all sorts of interesting wrinkles that play a big part in how we talk about everyday politics, right? So, so without time, it isn't obvious to me what the heck credibility means. It isn't obvious to me what the issue of commitment is if we don't have time to talk about what tomorrow is. It isn't obvious to me why somebody would vote the way that they did if they weren't acting on expectations about what they thought the future would look like. So without time, there's just... We'd be missing a lot of the story. Now, we'll be talking about extensive form games on and off for the rest of the class. These, this is a, a very important branch of, of, of game theory. So in broad brushstrokes, you can think about sort of introductory game theory as something that happens in a two-by-two two typology where one of the variables in question is are the moves simultaneous or sequential? 
And the other dimension in question is, do the players know everything about each other or the game or whatever? Is there complete information? And up to this point, we have resided in only one quadrant of this typology, the simultaneous move, complete information world of just vanilla Nash equilibrium, as we've discussed it over the previous weeks. We now find ourselves in a new quadrant of this typology. It is the part of the typology where all the information is still known. We have complete information. There's nothing about me that you don't know and vice versa. But our moves are now embedded in some sequential structure. These extensive form games, I'm, I'm quite sure if you're like most people, you will prefer them in the long run to simultaneous move games like you can depict them in matrices. Um, extensive form games, especially the introductory versions, are very tangible, they're easy to understand, they're easy to analyze, this should all be a little bit simpler even than what you've done. I mean, Mixed Strategy Nash Equilibrium is a, is a wonky concept. It, I, I mean wonky in the sense that only a wonk cares about it. And so we'll be moving on to decision trees that are a little bit more intuitive, and I, I get the sense that you're going to be able to, to play with these a little bit more easily, which is, which is good news. My goal for today is to introduce a bunch of these from a bunch of different angles, a lot like I did just in the regular games lecture, so that you feel comfortable with the fables and you have a sense about the role of time, expectation, and so on um, once we start to analyze them in the coming weeks. In the A block, I'd like to introduce the simplest possible extensive form game as it applies to political science, which is the candidate entry game. The question here is whether or not somebody would like to, to run against an incumbent candidate and how their views on what will happen shape that decision. You know, I'll be showing you foundational things and it wouldn't be very hard to modify any one of them in any given direction if one were so inclined. And in fact, part of my goal will be to show you how the candidate entry game with a simple extension actually doesn't have nothing to do with an important topic in international relations. In the B block, I want to talk about voting games and what they look like in the sequential world. So on your problem set a few weeks ago, you did a simultaneous move voting game and you learned that there were some interesting and somewhat counterintuitive predictions in the Nash equilibrium analysis. So not only was it a pure strategy Nash equilibrium for everybody to vote for their preferred candidate, it's also a pure strategy Nash equilibrium to arrive at any of the unanimous profiles, no matter how perverse. The reason for that wasn't that people had something odd going on in their preference structures, but rather that their deviation wasn't enough to move the needle. Nothing changed, and because of that, nobody had a profitable deviation. But many voting contexts are sequential. Now, not in sort of voting that we do when we go vote for leaders, but certainly on floors of legislatures, there is sequential voting. And there's a lot of study about interesting differences between voting that was sequential versus voting that was not sequential, sort of roll call votes versus not roll call votes. And so it turns out that the particular design of a, of a sequence has big ramifications on how voting plays out in legislatures. Now, we won't go all the way. We'll talk about that next week when we talk about subgame perfection. Um, but even just seeing voting as a sequential thing rather than as a simultaneous thing I suspect that your intuitions about the game that I draw for voting will be far closer to what I'm talking about than what they were in the simultaneous move version. I think that probably I'm, we're converging to your priors more than you realize. And then in the C block, I want to introduce another important class of extensive form games, the ultimatum games. Uh, the ultimatum game plays a very big part in American political institutions, comparative politics, international relations, bargaining, um, the ultimatum game is ubiquitous, and for good reason. Um, it's a very important game. It's a very easy game to understand. It looks incredibly political. It turns out that it isn't just political, but it's also deeply economic. The ultimatum game is a beauty. I love all of the games I'm going to be showing you today, but I love the ultimatum game best, if I'm being honest. It's my favorite fable. And I don't even want to talk about how to analyze these things, because it, the ultimatum game... So, so this is my guess. My guess is you will look at candidate entry, you'll look at the A block and have a sense in your mind about how to analyze it. And you'll look at voting in the B block and you'll have a sense in your mind about how to analyze it. But I think that the ultimatum game, might you might not feel so confident about what the next steps are going to be. And no matter what, we'll be talking about that next week, so don't worry. But these three extensive form games, these three classes of fables that we see once we introduce time into the equation, these are real workhorses for us. And these are the sort of things that in your other classes, you might not even realize that you're seeing games of this type because 
These archetypes are so broad. These are the major classes of interaction that we see in politics. These are the these are the worlds. These are the systems. These are the the different places that we live. And so somebody might not even take the time to say, "Oh, I'm in the I'm in the ultimatum universe right now." And that universe is very different from the voting game universe, which in turn is diff- is different from the candidate entry universe. These universes are in fact so distinct that it's hard to know when you're in one. So I hope that it's useful for you in your future classes to be able to look at a paper that you read or a concept that you get assigned in one of your other classes and say, oh, I can see that even if I don't understand every detail, there's an underlying ultimatum thing going on there. There's an underlying candidate entry thing going on there. If you can do that, then you're off to a really good start because I promise you analysis of this will be one of the simpler things that I teach you this semester. Regardless, I think that this is a very one half way into the class it's time for us to really start to think about some deeper topics. You have a lot of command over these rudiments and it's time to start to have some fun. And my sense is this is gonna be some really fun stuff. So let's get started. So suppose that you were thinking about running for office. Please don't ask me to vote for you. That's very awkward. I don't care. I I don't know. I don't know your platform and I don't want to. Please don't ask me to vote for you. I wish you well, vaya con Dios, but I, uh, please don't ask me to vote for you in your campaign. You're thinking, running for office is a real pain. People that are on campaigns, they look happy, but underneath the surface, they're suffering because running for office is a real pain. It's not a fun thing to do for most people, including most people who are politicians. Campaigning is a real pain. The other thing is, if you're thinking about running for office, Chances are excellent that there's already somebody that's in that office that is very much enjoying it. It turns out that being a successful politician, that looks pretty good on your resume. So you're thinking about running for office, but you have to be thinking, if I run, if I run, what are the odds that I find myself in in a vicious mud wrestling contest with an incumbent that would probably beat me in this competition, right? So suppose, for example, that you're running for office you're thinking about running for office and the, the incumbent, you're thinking about running for representative and the incumbent for representative is very old. There have been rumors on all of the local politics insider websites that this person is thinking about retiring. So when you decide to run, that means that we're now in a world where you've run and the question then becomes, are, is there going to be this vicious mud wrestling contest of a, of, a, of a campaign, or are you going to get an easy, smooth victory because they retired? However, if you don't run, we don't know anything else that happens because now everything is, is, is such a hypothetical. If you don't run, then you get a status quo payoff and that's it. So in other words, your decision about what to do has to be influenced by what you think will happen if you do run. If you don't run, there's, we're in the status quo. There's no, there's no new wrinkles. But if you run, then we have to think about what the incumbent would do. That's the candidate entry game, and I want to show you how to draw it. Okay. So the idea is like this. I'm going to draw a decision tree. There will be nodes distributed throughout the tree, and as we proceed through the class, I will call out different kinds of nodes. I will be teaching you about different kinds of nodes. The kind of game that I'm showing you today, or the game I'm about to draw, has only two kinds of nodes. There are decision nodes and there are terminal nodes. All right, and a node is just a dot. So when I say that there's a node at the start of time, that means I'm gonna draw a dot right here. Ding! And this represents the decision made by you, the challenger. So the challenger is at this dot. And the challenger has one of two options. They can either run for office or they can not run for office. If they don't run for office, that's this branch right here. And if they don't run for office, that takes us to a terminal node called the status quo. And at that status quo, we'll just normalize the payoff that you, the challenger, gets for the status quo to zero. Here's the zero happiness points. The idea here is that utilities are no longer just about combinations of choices. They are no longer on that Cartesian product. Now they're on all the different nodes. They're on all the terminal nodes. So every time we get to a terminal node, every time we get to the end of the chain, there will be utility numbers. 
So you get zero happiness points at the terminal node called status quo, which is what happens if you don't run. However, if you do run, then it depends. It depends on what? It depends on the choice made by another player named the incumbent. In particular, suppose that if you run, then the incumbent can either campaign or retire. If they campaign, then you get minus one happiness points. You would rather not campaign. Campaigning is a pain in the butt. You'd have to, you know, people would be vetting you. They'd be vetting everybody that you love and care about. It's a real pain in the butt. You'd have to drive all over. It's a pain. You'd have to pretend like when people are talking, you're nodding thoughtfully as if you're listening. That sounds awful. Kissing hands, shaking babies. You don't want any of this. So you get minus one happiness points if they campaign. That that's, that goes to a terminal node called Vicious Mud Wrestling Contest of a Campaign. However, if they retire, then that goes to a terminal node called You Win, and you get one happiness point. So I'm going to put all of your utilities, they'll be the top number every time, or the first number every time. Whoever moves first, we'll call, they're like akin to the role player. So, so we'll put the numbers in, in the order of whoever got the move first. So you get zero for the status quo, you get minus one for being forced into campaigning, and you get plus one for winning the election because the candidate retired, the incumbent retired. Let's put in some happiness numbers for the incumbent. Well, if you don't run, then they still, they don't have to campaign and they still get to draw the benefits of office. So we'll call that one happiness point for them. They really, they would be very enthused if we didn't have to worry about that. So they get one happiness point for having, for, for winning unopposed. Let's say because they're a grizzled veteran that they get zero happiness points for campaigning. You know, they've been through those battles before. They don't want to fight them again, but they've been through it before. And we'll say retiring gets the minus one happiness points. So this is a decision tree. It's a decision tree that's comprised of nodes. We've had two decision nodes, one controlled by the challenger, you, and one controlled by the incumbent. The incumbent node might not get hit, right? So if you don't run, then we never get to learn what the incumbent would have done. This is actually a big thing, because when we analyze these things, we're going to have to proceed as if we knew what they would have done. But note that there are, there are paths of play. There are paths that I could take through this tree. There are paths that go from the beginning of time, your decision, to a terminal node, a path is just going to be a set of edges, a set of lines that take us from the beginning of time, the root node, the first decision. Every game will have one of those. So every game has this root node. And a path is just a line that goes along the edges between nodes to a terminal node. And th there are paths that I could take that don't involve the incumbent making any decisions. But I'm still going to have to think about them. This is a big thing. For the next few weeks, bear that in mind. You will also have to think about what happens off of the path, off of the path of play. We want to study complete contingency plans with these things. You'll see. So we've got decision nodes, one of which is the root node, and one of which is another decision node controlled by the incumbent. And we've got three terminal nodes, the status quo node, the mud wrestling of a, of a campaign mo node, and the you win node. And for both players that are involved, we have specified utility functions that read in nodes, read in terminal nodes, and spit out happiness numbers. Just think about how much flexible you're, more flexible you're getting. You're getting nimbler. It's not just that you're learning things. You're getting nimbler. You're getting more prepared to learn other things. You're getting faster. You're getting more flexible. That's, that's what we're looking for here. This is a completely different style. This is a completely different thing, but it's also just related enough that, that you can follow me a little bit while I talk about it. That's pretty great. Keep going. Spend 10 more seconds thinking about somebody. So this is your first extensive form game. This is called the candidate entry game. It is everybody's first extensive form game. This is the first extensive form game that every political science major learns. Candidate entry is one of those things. And what makes it kind of cool is like, Every node is like a, you could stop. You make a decision that could either keep the thing going or you could stop. And then somebody else makes a decision that could keep the thing going or stop. And then maybe somebody else makes another decision that could either keep something going or stop. 
So this game, this extensive form game, what, what makes it special, if you ask me, what the thing that you see a lot is like, one decision ends in a terminal node and the other goes to a decision node, somebody else's decision node. So let me show you what I mean by extent, by, by writing down a similar model that's also very well known. Um, and you'll see that what, I, what I'm talking about here, I'm gonna write down something called the centipede game. So the centipede game has two players, just like before, but now there's gonna be multiple nodes for each player. Chewie says hi. So at the beginning of time, player one makes the first choice and they have two options. They can either take or pass. This, every decision is gonna be binary, either take or pass. Where the idea here is like, I could either take all the money that's on the table or I could pass it to you, right? And some more, you get some money in the process. Like, like along the way, the pile of money gets bigger. And then you could either take, take what you have or pass it back to me and the pile gets bigger. So in other words, we can keep doing something cooperative. The idea here is like, we keep pushing, we keep passing the money back to one another and the money keeps growing. But at any point in time, one of us could just keep it. Right? So we could go as many as a hundred times of possible iterations. I'm gonna show you one where it's two because it's easier to draw and I think you'll get the idea anyway. But the idea is like there's some positive externality that's being kicked in. There's some positive thing that's being born out of our continual cooperation, our refusal to cheat on one another, our ref right? Something good is happening. There's, there's good vibes flowing through us passing this, keep hitting pass, but there's always this perpetual threat that somebody might just take, okay? So at the beginning of time, I can either take and get one happiness point There'll be a decision node where we barely, we, we didn't really play and that's mine. And I get the, I get one happiness point and you get no happiness points. Player two gets no happiness points. So that's like, we didn't get any of the benefits of passing the ball. If I pass, then you can make a decision. So you can either take and get two happiness points and I get none or you can pass, right? So, so the idea here, notice that you're getting, if you, if you, take, you get two. I only got one if I took the first time. So you pass back to me. If you pass back to me, then I can either take or pass. If I take, I get three happiness points. Whoever takes gets more happiness points than the person that could have the time before, right? This We're getting this positive benefit from passing and you only get one happiness point. And then we'll make the next decision, the last one, although it could keep going. If I, if I pass, then you, player two, get to make the final, the fourth decision, the fourth possible decision. You can either take or pass. If you take, then you get four happiness points and I only get two. And if you pass, then we get an egalitarian 3-3. Three, three. So this is the centipede game. You can imagine that if we made 100 choices, actually, I'll draw it anyway. I'll draw, I'll draw 100. Oh boy, am I making a big commitment right now that editor Rob is not prepared to keep. Time matters, it turns out. Um, so I'll draw the 100 one. You can imagine it would look like a centipede, but there's sort of a, a prisoner's dilemma sort of logic where it's like, oh, I really hope that we can keep passing. I hope that we can just kind of keep generating this positive thing by, oh no, I don't want to, you take it. And you're like, oh no, I don't want to, you take it. Oh no, I insist. Oh no, I insist. Oh, I must insist really. But imagine that that was more than just hot air and it was actually contributing into a public good. Imagine that every day we went out and we didn't steal from one another, that generated benefits. But it has a similar logic to candidate entry. It has a similar, if not numbers associated with it, there's a similar structure. You can either end the game or you can keep going. And then the person that makes a decision can either end the game or keep going. And then the person that makes the next decision can either end the game or keep going. That's sort of what, what I'm talking about here in, in this A block is sort of introductory games that have that sort of flavor. Let me show you a more substantively motivated one that has a similar flavor as well. Let's talk about a simple model of audience costs. So this is an influential idea in international relations. The idea is that there's two countries, we'll call them A and B. And country A is the, is the country that makes the first move. So they have the root node, they get to make the first decision at the beginning of time. And they have a binary choice. At the beginning of time, country A can either do nothing and accept a status quo outcome, or they can issue a challenge to country B. They say, hey, we need more stuff, or else I'll fight you. So they can either end the game 
status quo payoff, or they can challenge this uh, country B. Now, if country B gets challenged, they can do one of two things. They can either acquiesce to the challenge and say, oh no, you're right here, have the thing that you asked for. Or they can say, oh yeah, fine, name a day and time. You know, they can accept the challenge. They can say, okay, we're ready to fight too. They can escalate. We'll call that, uh, that sounds like a scientific term, is they can escalate the fight. But, and now, if you're country A, now you're back. Country A makes the third move here, if there is one. And they can either back down, or they can actually accept the terms and we start a war. They can fight. So, so player A, country A gets the move twice, potentially. At the beginning of time, they can either accept the status quo or they can issue a challenge. And at the third decision node, if they get to make a choice there, they can either back down from their initial challenge and say, oh, mea culpa, didn't mean to start a fight with you. Go about your business. Have a nice day, country B. Or they can, start, they can actually follow through with their challenge and initiate the war. So let's just think about how we might some assign the utilities to a game like this. So we've got four possible outcomes. There are four terminal nodes that I've described. There's the status quo terminal node. That's what happens if country A doesn't issue any challenges, right? So that's the case, let's say the country A gets zero and country B gets one. You know, they're happy they didn't get any threats issued against them. Then there's also another terminal node where country A challenged and country B acquiesced to the challenge, right? They said, oh no, you're right. They were, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to start a fight with, uh, we don't wanna fight. Thank you for challenging us. Let's let this be the end of our business. So if that's the case, let's say that country A gets one happiness point because their, their challenge worked and country B gets minus one happiness points, we'll say. So th that's two terminal nodes handled. Every terminal node, I need to put utilities for every rel related player, countries, voters, whatever. And then there, there's two final uh, terminal nodes. One of them is the one where country A challenged, country B accepted the challenge, they, they escalated, and then country A backed down. They said, oh, we didn't mean, to, sorry, we just got ourselves into a fight we weren't ready for. Um, so country A then will get something called an audience cost. The idea here is that the citizens of country A will get very mad at their leader. If the leader issues a challenge, that then they don't follow through on, they look like an idiot, right? Audience costs are what happens when your population thinks that you, a leader, are an idiot. Audience costs, okay? So we'll call that minus A, where A is the magnitude of the audience cost. Maybe that's minus 3,000, maybe it's minus one, whatever. Maybe it's minus something really close to zero, you know, it could... The magnitude of the audience cost is one of the straws during the drink in an audience cost model like this, as you may have guessed from the name. Country B, let's say that they get one extra happiness point because now nobody's going to threaten them again because like country A went up to them and they're like, what's up? And country B's like, all right, you want to fight? Big mama's ready. And then country A's like, like that, that's probably going to help country B's reputation as a, apparently as a big mama. So that gets extra happiness point for country two, we'll say. I'm modeling right now. This is just, we're just modeling. And we'll say, let's let's keep things traditional. Let's say that the expected utility of war, if war happens, is P minus CA and one minus P minus CB. So that's a cool model, right? This is a very influential model in international relations. Once you get to know another country's audience cost, like I maybe I know my population more than you do, right? So I might have private information about my audience costs. We're not there yet. This is a little bit boring with complete information, but with incomplete information, where I know my audience costs and you don't, now things get interesting. Maybe democracies behave a little bit differently because they have these, they have these audience costs. Leaders get worried about being thrown out of office. And then Jessica Weeks did some nice work that said sort of, oh, well, you know, that's true, but you don't think that they throw autocrats out of, out of office if they go around making stupid challenges? Not only do they throw them out of office, sometimes they cut their heads off. Now, cutting heads off isn't really part of this model, but you get the, that would be a very big A, is you get your head chopped off. So, so this is an area, this is an active thought. Like in international relations, this is an influential line of thinking, and it's just doom, 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 right? Now, we'll enrich it, we'll add this private information later on, but that's the core interaction that people are thinking about a lot of the time. 
It isn't a simultaneous move thing. It's not chicken. It's not matching pennies. It's not Bakker Stravinsky. It's not simultaneous. They're thinking that there's this sort of back and forth going on where somebody can exit the interaction and potentially eat a bad outcome, or they can keep going, right? And if they keep going, then maybe something nasty will happen in the long run. They got to think ahead. They got to look down the tree. Whenever somebody says to you, and I don't know if this is an idiom in your everyday life, but in my everyday life, look down the tree is an everyday idiom. And for me, looking down the tree means make your decision in, with reasonable expectations about what the future decision makers are going to be doing. And I think games with this particular shape highlight that because at any point in time, you could just end the game. Centipede, you could end the game. Candidate entry, you could just end the game. Audience cost, you can just end the game. You got to look down the tree or you can just end the game. Pretty cool. So that's Baby's first extensive form games, maybe. You, you may have seen some of these before. These are very popular. These are straightforward. These are great for dinner parties. Uh, you, you can just draw this anytime you need to. There's a lot of really cool stuff in there. But it turns out there's going to be a lot of other really cool stuff with more interesting contingencies, with, with a broader array of contingencies. So I just want to show you a voting game. So we'll talk about that in the B block, which will arise momentarily. So suppose that three legislators were voting on whether or not to give themselves a raise. People get really angry when legislators or other government officials give themselves raises. Um, I have no thoughts on any of this. But it is true, if I were a legislator, which thank God I'm not, if I were a legislator, I would like to get pay raises while never ever voting for them. Right? I would like somebody else to do the voting on that. So one is, but if, if it's legislators that have to vote to give themselves raises, then, then how does that all play out, right? This happens. This happens. It's not like the president says to Congress, well, I'm giving you a raise. No, Congress votes on its own raises. That's controversial. Suppose we have three legislators, we'll call them one, two, and three. And the idea here is that voter one will say they come first alphabetically. Okay. So we'll say that voter one comes first alphabetically, so and that's going to be a roll call vote, so they get to vote first. So voter one votes first, then voter two, then voter three. Right? This is no longer a simultaneous vote like it was before. And the idea here is that they all want a pay raise, but they don't want to pay the costs of voting yay for it. They want to vote nay. And we'll assume this is all by majority rule. At the beginning of time, at the root node, voter one can either vote yay or nay. They can vote yes or they can vote no to give themselves a raise. Regardless, either way, voter two votes next and they see what happens. They see what voter one did, right? This is a public vote. This is, the, I vote yes. I'm voter one in this scenario. I vote yes or I vote no. Then you, voter two, observe. You see what voter one did. You see what voter one did and then you vote. Either way you vote. This goes to a decision node for player two either way. The end of time will only be after everybody's voted. Now it's not you can opt out. There is no opt out. There is no opt out in this model. Everybody's voting it just in a sequence. So voter two can either vote yay or nay. Now we've got, there were two branches. Now there's like one, two, and then one, two, one, two. Now we've got four possible things. There's the world where, where one was a yay and two was a yay. There's the one where one was a yay and two was a nay. There's the one where one was a nay and two was a yay. And there's the one where they were both nays. And then finally, voter three votes. Okay, voter three can vote yay or nay. So now we've got eight possible outcomes. There are eight terminal nodes of this game. Yay, yay, yay. Yay, yay, nay. Yay, nay, yay. Yay, nay, nay. Nay, yay, yay. Nay, nay, yay, nay. Nay, nay, yay, and nay, nay, nay. Eight possible outcomes. Boy, I feel like an idiot right now. So the idea here is that if there were two votes that were yays, then everybody gets a happiness point. They all want to raise. However, anybody that voted yay, irrespective of whether it passed, has to pay a cost, C. So for example, this top world, the yay, yay, yay one, everybody voted yes. 
And so the three payoffs are going to be one minus C, one minus C, and one minus C. They all get the happiness point, but they all had to pay the cost because they all voted yay. If we were in the yay, yay, nay, the next node down, where voter three voted nay, then voter one would pay would get one minus C because they still got to pay that cost. Voter two would pay one minus C. Voter three is like, oh, I get the benefits and I don't have to pay the cost. They would just get one happiness point. They wouldn't pay any cost because they voted nay. A similar thing goes for voter two if we go one node down. So that's a yay, nay, yay, right? Voter one voted yay, voter two voted nay, and voter three voted yay. Well, that means one minus C, one for the, I get to enjoy all the benefits voter two now, and one minus C for voter three. However, consider the next node down. That's the voter one voted yes, and voters two and three both voted no. Now voter one, they still got to pay the cost. They look like an idiot and they didn't get a raise, so they get minus C. And voters two and three, they get zero. The next one down is a happier story for voter one. That's the one where they voted nay and the other two voted yay. So it's one, one minus C, one minus C. The next one down is nay, yay, nay, which means zero minus C, zero, because voter two voted yay and it wasn't enough to win. They look like an idiot. The next one down is nay, nay, yay. That's two no votes and a yes vote. That's insufficient. So voter three pays minus C. So it's zero, zero minus C. And the last one is they were all cowards. None of them voted yes, and there's a zero, zero, zero. So notice that, you know, there, there's, there's basically two outcomes. It either passed or it didn't. But there's some costs involved. And, and a lot of the question here is, how does the institutional structure of time, how does the fact that voter one votes first, is that going to help them or hurt them? Right? That's the question with a model like this is does whoever gets the vote first, do they have advantages? Do they have disadvantages? How about the person that votes last? Do they have advantages? Do they have disadvantages? Because look, if voter one votes yes, their possible range of outcomes is one minus C all the way down to minus C. There's a lot of different things that could happen. They have to act on expectations of the future voters. Do they believe that, the voter, that those voters are going to act in their own interests? Do they have faith? that voters two and three will both vote, both vote yay, and therefore that they can get away with maybe a nay vote? What about voter three? They're the one that they, they're going to have to react to everybody else. Now, sometimes that's a real positive, right? So if you play any poker, you know that you want the dealer button. You want to be the person that moves last when you play poker because you can see what everybody else did, right? If it's overtime football, you want to move second. You want You want to play second. If you're the prosecution in a court case, you want to give your closing remarks last. You want to be able to respond to what you don't want the last word to go to somebody else. So many times there are last mover advantages. Will that play out here? We'll see next week. First mover, you can see voters one and three have completely different jobs here. They have completely different strategic problems here. They are completely different, even though they are clearly the same. The institutional structure induces design things. It induces design wrinkles that, that, that play with time, that play with anticipation and play with observation. So voting in a roll call situation is a major strategic issue. Notice here, there are three voters and, and, two, uh, and eight possible outcomes. That's two to the thirds, right? And it's true. So you know, this tree would just keep branching. Suppose there was a voter four, then they would take this eight to 16. Voter five would take us from 16 to 32, right? So that tree that we have to look down, if we're going to live up to my it everyday idiom, that looking down the tree, that tree is really complicated. Voter one is making one choice, irrespective of how complicated that tree is getting. Voter one makes one and only one choice. And then the gigantic Plinko game of life kicks in. Some of you are probably too. On The Price is Right, there's a game called Plinko where you drop a little chip and that ch they have a board. There's like a board with nails on it. Okay, the nails are at little regular intervals like a grid. So you, you, get a, you get a little disc and you put it against the board anywhere you want and you drop it. And then it can go left or right at every one of these nails. It can go ding-a-ding-a-ding-a-ding-a-ding. -a -ding -a -ding -a -ding. And so the idea is it falls down randomly 
down these things. And then there's slots with different money amounts at the bottom. And you want it to land in one of the slots with lots of money, right? So you drop the Plinko chip and then $10,000. Or you drop the Plinko chip, no dollars, right? So that's Plinko. Voter one is playing Plinko right now. Voter one, they don't know what the heck is going to happen or do they? Stay tuned. But that's these voting games. There's a lot of I mean, voter. It's, I'm not even embellishing. Voter one is making literally one choice. And then who knows? Well, the algorithms that we're going to imply to study these things will give us a very precise way to try to analyze. them. Yeah. But I just want you to think about what would 10 voters look like? What would 100 voters in the Senate look like? They do roll call votes in the Senate sometimes when they're feeling especially generous with how they feel about things. What if there were 435 of them? What if everybody in the United States, when they voted for office, voted sequentially instead of at the same or over some three week span or however long we're doing it this time? That would be the world's biggest Plinko game of politics. And we're saying, I don't want to, before we get to announce, I'm saying that whoever makes this early choice, voter one here in this giant Plinko game of voting, they look down the tree, they're going to evaluate all these contingencies. These voting games are especially complicated because there's never like an opt-out. They just keep going until we have this giant tree of possibilities, you know. That's just voting in the Senate. I don't have enough screen space. This is, we're, 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 we're not in 4K. If I had 4K, maybe I'd be able to get the whole Senate, but in 1080, I can't do it. So that's a voting game. That's what voting looks like here. It, it's, it's a very similar looking aesthetic, but that, the structure of it is actually a little bit different, right? Where it's like, instead of opt out or continue, now it's like, vote and see what happens. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool, right? Um, so, so this same apparatus of a tree with some choices, some nodes. Here there's eight terminal nodes. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven decision nodes, right? But it's, it's just the same apparatus. It's the same apparatus just being used to tell two very different kinds of stories. In the C block, I want to show you one final interesting class of these models. This is by no means exhaustive, but it's a, it's a slightly different one that I think adds a lot, a lot of interesting wrinkles. So, so I'll see you over in the C block. So all these choices so far have been discrete. Yay or nay, pass or take, run or not run, campaign or retire, acquiesce or challenge, or whatever I said. I already forget what I said. There's no notes. They should. I should make notes. I should have notes. The notes would make this all far simpler, but no. Sister Rosalinda just wouldn't want it that way. Yes, she would. So I want to talk about what happens with the continuous thing. What happens when you can choose something a little bit bigger than just left or right? Okay. So, so the idea here is, um, is I'm going to show you something called the ultimatum game. And the ultimatum game is, is baby's first bargaining model. Um, it, it shows you what bargaining looks like in a protocol. This is going to be our first bargaining protocol. This is going to be the first way that we, without normative analysis, we're not gonna use like Nash bargaining solutions like we used in the one problem set. Now we're gonna say, here's what a bargaining problem looks like when it's equipped with a particular institutional structure or a particular procedural structure. This is the first way for us to talk about how bargaining proceeds. So the idea goes like this. There's two parties, we'll call them player one and player two. Uh, the two main applications that you see of the ultimatum game are in international relations and in legislative politics. And I'll sh we'll, we'll do both of those on problem sets. So I'll talk about this in the abstract right now. But you can imagine either one country making a take it or leave it offer to another in terms of how to divide some good that they care about. Or you can imagine some legislator making a proposal to a median voter saying, I want to change the status. I want to go from the status quo to this new point, to this new proposal that I levy. Uh, but either way, an offer is made, a proposal is made, and then it is either accepted or rejected. That's the, that's the basic logic here. So suppose the player one can choose some X, 
between zero and one. To capture that, instead of this like, instead of like the, the fingers, I'll use this little Assassin's Creed logo hoodie. I'll put this little and what that means is they can choose this one out of this entire range that goes from zero to one, okay? So they can choose any out of the zero one range, okay? They could choose zero, they could choose one, they could choose one half, they could choose three quarters or one quarter or seven eighths or one eighths. They could, anywhere in this range, they're choosing some proportion of the, of the territory or they're choosing some um, proposal in a policy space. They're choosing something out of a continuum. And the idea here is that after observing that proposal, uh, player two can either accept or reject the proposal. They can either take the X or they can not take the X. And the idea is accepting is the happy payoff that will be determined by what the proposal was. You can accept the proposal and live to its terms, or you can reject the proposal and end up a disagreement point land. So how do we encode that? Well, suppose that if, if player two accepts the offer, we'll say that player one gets to keep X and then player two gets one minus X. So notice, remember from bargaining week that I said the one thing that makes bargaining bargaining is that they have opposed preferences over the good outcome. So here the good outcomes are accepted proposals. Okay. So if the proposal is accepted, then that means that player one wants it to be a good one. They want X to be high. They get to keep more X. X is the proportion of stuff that, 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 that player one gets to keep. And one minus X goes to, to player two. So they have opposed preferences. Player one wants X to be high and player two wants X to be low. Okay. And the idea here is that if the offer is rejected, then something bad happens. The disagreement point happens. And so we could, we could just say D1, D2 if we wanted. Probably the most straightforward would be to be 0, 0. So we'll say 0, 0 there to start. A good introductory ultimatum game is if they fail to make an agreement, then they get 0. So this is the ultimatum game. The ultimatum game says player one makes a take it or leave it offer to player two. If player two accepts it, then we get the outcome that was driven by that proposal. Right. So so notice that the that the utilities that 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 the players get at the accept node is endogenous to the proposal. It depends on the proposal. X and one minus X depend on what X was chosen. X is not outside of the model. X was chosen inside the model. Player one chose X. Right? This is what makes an ultimatum game an ultimatum game. Player one chose X. That determines the terms of the happiness. They get to choose where on the frontier we live. However, they have to make an acceptable offer. But they have to make an acceptable offer because player two is the person that determines whether or not we're at the, the happy node or at the disagreement node. So if they make an offer that makes player two angry, then maybe that maybe they chose the wrong X. Maybe they set X way too high. That that irritated state two, that irritated player two, and now player two is like, ah, I, I, I reject your offer, go to hell. That's what we're encoding here, right? So what I can talk about countries or I can talk about legislators, but we're talking about how to buy a car. So this structure of the ultimatum game it's a very big deal because, um, you know, we can change how big the range is. You know, it doesn't have to be zero one. It could, you know, we can change that. We can change, you know, what's the payoff for what, what are the sum of the payoffs? We could change what's the disagreement point, but all of those will be only quantitative. The shape of this is what really matters here. So this is one iteration of, of ultimatum game, right? Imagine that we repeated it. Here's an interesting idea. Suppose that instead, if, if suppose that if player two rejected the offer, think about bargaining. Think about haggling. If you haggle, if you reject an offer while you're haggling, is that the end of the interaction? No. So what gives? This model has like, they only do this one time. Well, who said it only had to be one time? So, so suppose that, that player two could either accept the offer or reject. If they accept the offer, then it's X1 minus X. But if they reject the offer, then they get to make a proposal. Call it Y. And we'll say 
The then player one can either accept Y or they can reject Y. And if they accept Y, then it's Y and one minus Y. And if they reject, then it's zero, zero. So the, you can you can keep adding to this, right? So you can actually add an infinite horizon to this. We'll talk about that model at the end of the class. But haggling is just repeating this ultimatum thing again and again and again and again and again. I'll give you five bucks for that. I need 20. Oh, well, how about seven? How about 18? How about 10? How about 12? How about 11? Okay. That's haggling, right? Reject, 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 reject. Accept. X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. That's, that's bargaining. That's what bargaining looks like to you. Bargaining is this problem. You can see the bargaining problem with just one iteration of the ultimatum game. The ultimatum game is the bargaining problem with a procedure. It's just that we can, we can extend that procedure as long as we need to. That's pretty cool. And this is, I'm not embellishing, this is the core model. This is one of the core games. This game is everywhere. You can't, once we talk about how to apply this game, you'll never unsee this game. This game is everywhere. Ultimata are everywhere. So while we're here, let me show you a related model. The legislative version, the IR version is very close to this, right? I mean, it's, it's gonna look just like this, but I wanna show you something that doesn't, it wouldn't be obvious to you that it's the same, but it actually is kind of the same. This is a very influential model from legislative politics called the pivotal politics model. So the pivotal politics model is not going to have a tree the same way. I mean, you could make a tree if you wanted to, but actually the easiest way to see the pivotal politics model is to go back to that policy space that we did when we did that median voter theorem a few weeks back. And you're like, I was hoping to put that behind me. You did great. You did a wonderful job. Many of you got most of it. It's a hard question. You did a good job. You asked great questions. You're not going to get all these things the first time. It's okay. Hello? Hi. Sorry, I'm very close to being done. So here's a policy space. Let's say it's the whole real line. And the idea here is that there's going to be somebody in Congress who has proposal power. Somebody is chosen to make a proposal. And so they want to make a proposal that improves the policy relative to some status quo. So as of right now, I'm going to put a proposer in the space. I'm going to draw this somewhat arbitrarily. You'll see that the order matters quite a bit. So on the right side here, let's say that there's some, let's say there's some proposer. There's somebody named P. Okay. And let's say this is their ideal point. So this is X hat sub P. This is their favorite policy. It lives right here. And let's say that the status quo on, a, on an issue that matters to them lives far in the other direction. So let's say the status quo policy lives right here in the policy space. I'll just call that Q. That, that, that Q represents the current position. That's this current status quo is Q. So the proposer would like to try to come up with a policy that improves upon Q. They want, look how far it is. It's not close to their ideal point. But I'm not sure if you noticed, but most legislators don't just get to impose whatever they want. They have to, there's a vote. So they need to come up with a proposal that is appealing to the median voter. So suppose that in between these two lived X hat M. Now the question becomes, what's the best proposal that the proposer could make on the understanding that the yay nay vote, the up down vote made by the median voter will be decisive. This is an ultimatum game where player one is the proposer and player two is the median voter. Q establishes the disagreement point. Let's think about that. Let me, let me just draw an ultimatum game. So now, instead of going from zero to one, the Assassin's Creed hoodie can go from minus infinity to infinity. So the idea is to choose some proposal, we'll call it X, between minus infinity and, an inf and infinity. They can choose any real number they want to. He's a very powerful legislator, apparently. And they seem to be able to count to much higher numbers than I suspected them to be able to. So this proposer, they make this proposal, they choose an X, right? And then the median voter gets to move next. They can either vote yay or vote nay. If they vote yay, then the two players enjoy the utilities from the proposal, right? So whatever this proposal was, we'll just say that they have absolute negative absolute value utilities like they had on that problem set. So we'll just say negative absolute value of X minus X hat P and negative absolute value of X minus X hat M. And the same goes if the offer is rejected, it's just that instead of P, it's Q. Instead of, instead of X, it's Q. Instead of the proposal, it's the status quo. 
So that is the pivotal politics model, which is just an ultimatum game. It's just an ultimatum game. I make you an offer and you can accept or reject it. If you accept it, then we live up to the terms of the offer with some stipulated utilities. And if you reject, then we go to some disagreement point. It's bargaining. It's legislative bargaining. You can extend this too. So instead of having a bunch of different rounds, you could have like, okay, well, if you swing and miss with your proposal, then the next legislator can, can propose something. And if they swing and miss, then the next legislator can propose something. And if they swing and miss, that could, that could go forever. That's actually a canonical model in legislative bargaining. That's called the Baron Farajan model. 1989. This is, we're, we're, we're getting up. We're, we're catching up. You see, we're catching up. We were in the 1800s when we were doing utility theory. We're up to 1989. I was born by then. You're like, I thought you were born when we were talking about Cornell. Shut up. So, so that's the idea. It's the same structure. It's the same class of interaction. It's the same kind of interaction. It's the same kind of interaction, right? Buying a used car, getting getting a bill through Congress, figuring out how to draw a border between two countries, they're all ultimata. Now, there might be different institutional procedures. There might be different disagreement points. There might be different policy spaces, but they're the same thing. It's the same thing. This is why we write down fables. They're the same thing. They're the same thing. So I hope that this little tour of these three classes of models, right? So, so sort of entry exit games, voting games, and ultimata. I hope that this gets you interested because there's a lot of cool things on these things. These are bones that you could put a lot of really cool flesh onto. You can do a lot of different cool things with these. And we're only scratching the surface of their applicability throughout politics. There's a lot of classes of interactions that we have not yet properly identified as ult ultimatum-like behavior. There's a lot of cool stuff out there, it turns out. So we're gonna be analyzing models like these for like two, three weeks now. And there's a lot of wrinkles. Um, but I think those wrinkles, they're, they're gonna start to look a little bit more political to you. They're not gonna be quite so much with the, oh, you gotta choose just the right cue so that I render you indifferent over your expected utilities. They're still gonna be expected utilities and indifference, but but the choices themselves are gonna have more obviously political flavors. Now, many of you are creative and have had no problem identifying the politics and what we've been talking about. And some of you are creative, but have had some trouble. That's okay. And that's, that's, on my, that's my fault. That's not your fault, that's my fault. Okay. But my hope is that you're starting to see some of the politics in this. My hope is that you could read a newspaper and start to see some of this. Cause this is what's happening. It's all around us, whether you see it or not. I hope that one day you're just going to leave your front door and suddenly it's all going to make sense. And then when it does, come find my front door and tell me what you learned because it doesn't make sense to me. So what are we talking about today? Well, it's... Maybe a bit of a breather lecture, which is good. You've earned some breather lectures. I just wanted to show you what would happen if we took our extant book of fables and added a wrinkle in time to it, right? There's a lot of interesting little, little nuances that emerge when we think about how intelligent contemplative decision makers make their decisions, not just when they're embedded in strategic contexts, which we've had up to this point, but also when those strategic contexts introduce matters of expectation and... Um, observation and how potentially institutional designs or even just straight up anarchy can introduce, you can have the same utilities over outcome. You can be identical to somebody and two players can seem very similar in terms of their preferences, but be very different in terms of when they move. And those differences, like in the, like in the voting game, those differences in when they move, that means that things that were the same are no longer the same. And that's really interesting. Not only is it interesting, it seems to comport with what happens both in institutionalized and uninstitutionalized settings. Which means that this is going to be a tool that we're going to go to pretty often. However, I think that this time and expectation and observation thing is, is tricky and nuanced and wrinkled uh, in, in ways that might not be immediately obvious to you. And so it's with that particular thing in mind that I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. The quest of a lot of science is causation. We want to understand causal mechanisms. We want to identify causal processes, right? So I want to know that if I, that if I go to college, that's going to cause me to have a higher salary when I graduate. 
or I want to know for sure that if I start a war, what would be the downstream causal consequences of that? What would that, what effects would that cause? I might want to know what is the effect of some change? What is the causal effect of some imposition? I might want to know, hey, I changed how I teach this semester. I want to know what's the causal effect on your understanding. Does my, do my pedagogical changes this semester influence the amount that you understand? And you're like, oh, fat man, trust me, I haven't learned anything this semester. And I'm like, actually, that's more, that's closer to the truth than you'd realize from the past. So this is causality. It's, it's hard. Nobody, causation is something that's been bothering us since as long as we could spell it. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult and wrinkled and nuanced topic. It might be the single most interesting and wrinkled and nuanced topic is what is a cause? What is causation? What is it to cause something? Now, in traditional notions of causality, the cause must precede the effect, right? So, so if I'm walking down the street, I'm walking down the street and I slip on ice. Why did I slip on the ice? Well, ice is slippery. And when, why is it slippery? Well, when I stepped on it, that caused, that little difference in the pressure caused some of the ice to melt at the very top. This is the mechanism I'm proposing right now. So when I press down on the ice, that melts the very top of the ice a little bit. So because I did that, next thing you know, the next moment in time, there was some ice melting. Then when that ice melted, what that did is it caused my shoe that was on the ice to not have the ability to dig in with friction. So now I've got this chain of events that started. I stepped on some ice that melted the ice. Then the melting of the ice caused my shoe to slip. Next thing you know, on my shoe slips, I've got an entire change in my center of gravity. All of my weight is shifted. All of this is happening after I stepped on the ice. I stepped on the ice and a chain of causation began. Right? I hate to brag, but I've got power windows in my car. So when I press the button to make the window go down, that doesn't go straight to the window. There's, I'm not an engineer. But there's all sorts of things that happen. There's, there are sensors, there are wires. That's what it looks like to me anyway. There's all sorts of circuits. There's a process that begins. It isn't just the case that you press the button and the window goes down. There's some things that happen in the middle, but they all happen after. Causes proceed. Causes come first. So can an expectation be a cause? Let's say we bumped into one another on campus and it wasn't raining, but you had an umbrella. And I say to you, what caused you to take an umbrella out today? I can imagine a couple different answers. One might just be Semper Piranus. You, you watched uh, Sharknado enough times to know that you should always be prepared. One of them might be that you were out earlier this morning when it had been raining. And so you had that umbrella because you saw that it was raining and it caused you to get the umbrella and you went and got it. Another might be that even if you didn't go out this morning when it was raining, let's say that you left the house when it wasn't raining, but you checked your phone and the weather app told you that it was going to rain. So your expectation of the rain is what caused you. But I just said the causes have to come first. Can an expectation be a cause? In that voting game that we wrote down, the, the first voter that moves first, they make one choice in the gigantic Plinko game of life. Nothing happens before that. Their vote happens at the beginning of time. Nothing could possibly cause them to do anything that happened prior because there is no prior. Their, that vote was at zero time. That was the beginning of time, was when that senator voted or when that representative voted to give themselves a raise. That was the beginning of time. There was nothing prior. So the only thing that could cause anything in that model are things that happen after. But we just said that causes have to proceed. So is cause the wrong word? And if so, what's the right one? And if not, did you just radically change your entire thoughts about what causation is? That seemed a little bit flimsy. You should stick to your guns. I'm not that provocative. All this to say, we're going to be studying procedures for a while here. And maybe what makes procedures procedures, maybe what makes institutions institutions, maybe what makes these things what they are is the fact that those actors that make choices inside of them can reliably say that they are acting where expectations are in fact causes. Even though that can't happen in the physical universe, maybe we design institutions in ways that make it possible in our institutionalized universe. That's the best that I can tell because I believe that uh, it seems, I'm not a physicist, but it seems to me as if causes proceed as I experience the physical world around me. 
It seems to me that if I hadn't stepped on that ice, then I wouldn't have slipped because the ice wouldn't have melted. But it also doesn't seem to me that that's how legislators work when they are operating in roll call votes. Those folks have a completely different set of physics. They have a completely different law of causation. Who made that? We made that. How? No idea. It's easy for us to have physics envy as political scientists. We all wish that we were hard scientists so that we would feel very awesome. But I think it's even cooler that we made up our own laws of physics as they apply to causation with respect to time. Maybe that's an especially heavy thought and maybe I'm bending this a little bit too far. But regardless, I just want to get you thinking about expectations, strategy, causation. I wish I had better answers for you for all these things. I guess the point of the provocative thought is I don't know what I'm going to say when I go into it and I certainly don't know the answer to these hard questions. So I really mean it when I say to you, thanks for watching.